How are y'all doing? Is this the first Singapore meetup? Yes. Right on. Good turnout for a first Singapore meetup. So I run the San Francisco meetup myself, um, co-organizing it with Greg. Greg. <laughs> um, and then one other individual. Um, I think on average we get about 30 people. This is a pretty good turnout for a first meetup. Kudos to all of you. So, we've had more people come in earlier than what we had. Uh, so show of hands again, how many use Ansible in production today? All right, how many of you are here to learn more about Ansible to kind of hear about it? Show of hands, okay. And then, um, so quick shout out from my understanding, uh, Ansible 1.9 users, hands up, okay, 2.0. Two one? Alright, no two ones. Anything less than one dot nine? No? Got a few environments still running. That's fine. It's all good. Okay, cool. So um, I'm not boring you with slides at all today. I'm an engineer, uh, just like all the rest of you. I hate slides, so I'm not gonna bore you with them. I'm only using them to keep me on track. I'm going to talk about the Ansible roadmap with you all and then talk about a cool new project that we launched last week uh, as well. And then um, I want to keep this interactive. So feel free to stop me mid-sentence if you want to, if you guys have any questions or just common general use case type questions of Ansible, feel free to ask me. Um, I'll talk for maybe 45 minutes um, and then we can see how long that goes based on uh, participation from you guys and then kind of go on from there. Um, so with that, to level set things, I'll talk about my past role. So before I joined Ansible a year ago, uh, I was actually in your seat. Um, my whole infrastructure was run with Ansible. It was a uh, large SaaS application, um, an APM application. Um, I was the first ops engineer there. Uh, when I joined, we had no automation, no configuration management whatsoever. And Ansible was incepted around the same time that I had joined my last job. So jumped right into using Ansible and we deployed our application from eight hours down to five minutes in uh, a day's time of writing our first playbook. And then the rest is history. Now I work for Ansible, loving every bit of it. Um, so two roles for me, one, tech evangelist, so I go out and, and preach the word of Ansible and get more people into the community, and then on the other side, I'm a product manager that handles integrations with Ansible Tower, as well as um, getting more ISVs or software vendors to write modules for Ansible, so everybody has more to write for playbooks. So, that all being said, uh, first, we're going to cover Ansible 2.1 and what we launched in terms of modules for 2.1. Then we'll talk about what's coming in 2.2. And in between those, I'll talk about that new project. Sound good? Cool. So, Ansible 2.1. The huge release for 2.1 is we're extending outside of just system automation. Um, how many of you actually know that we do network automation now. Show of hands. All right. So for the network side of the house, we're one of the only vendors, us being Red Hat, that actually automate Cisco devices. We automate Arista network devices. We automate uh, Juniper devices. We're working on automating OpenSwitch. Just basically anything that is a network hardware device, you can write a playbook and automate those, which is unheard of outside of the vendor themselves that make that piece of network hardware. It's been really cool. It's been an awesome story for us. We actually have two network engineers now. They're full-fledged, been in networking their whole careers that are writing these modules for you to use to automate network systems. So we're super excited about that effort that we put into it. Um, we've worked very closely with all these vendors, and all of these vendors are actually 
giving talks about using Ansible and they're actually working with their customers to use Ansible as the deployment mechanism for their switches, for their routers. Pretty unheard of, but it's kind of showing the change of technology and the change of software, how we're all just kind of getting along now as opposed to competing and clashing heads, right? And it shows that open source really is the driver of that. And Ansible has been that mechanism for a lot of different companies um, because of its modular state. Also in 2.1, we launched um, full Windows support. Um, so we're out of beta now. Uh, we feel fairly confident in what the capabilities of Windows are today when it comes to Ansible. Everything is PowerShell 3 driven um, over WinRM. The old days of Ansible, it used to be a Python environment in Windows. We all know how much of a pain in the butt that is. No more. So everything PowerShell 3. We also have full support of local users on systems. Um, domain users are supported as well, Kerberos and AD off, and NTLM. Um, so we're uh, working uh, very much on improving Windows continually with that. We actually have a full-time Windows development engineer working on Ansible Core. Um, and we'll talk about more what he's doing for the 2.2 time frame. Docker. Um, we made some changes to the Docker container as well as Docker um, image uh, modules. We also introduced the Docker image facts module to scan containers for information associated to the container itself. And then we created a module called Docker Service. Uh, Docker Service utilizes the, con the uh, Docker Compose uh, YAML format, which looks pretty much like a playbook, if you look at it closely, um, to start, stop, and scale multi-container services. And then um, Azure, uh, obviously with the Red Hat Microsoft announcement around Azure, um, we kind of piggybacked off of that, but also we were doing our own thing in the background at the same time to build out more support in the Azure cloud. So uh, we increased our support for managing virtual machines in Azure, um, the ability to manage virtual networks, uh, network interfaces, public IP management, uh, subnets and VPCs, virtual network um, interfaces and storage and security groups all in the 2.1 release so it was pretty pretty exciting stuff uh, 2.0 uh, I don't know most of if you know or not that was a huge re-architecture change for Ansible and how the core <laughs> engine works so our huge focus for 2.1 was the modules give more love to modules get Windows out of beta, get network out of the, um, the test setup that it was in and actually ship it. So um, we're super excited. 2.1 came out three weeks ago, I want to say now. So right when I started my trip. Um, so encourage all of you to get upgraded to 2.1. There's a lot of great stuff to be had with 2.1. Um, definitely some bug fixes from 2.0. A lot of changes from 1.9. Um, so give it a try. We'd love your feedback. And pull requests are more than welcome to with any new modules that you guys can think of for the 2.2 and onward time frame. So, before I move on, any questions about 2.1? Yes? Uh, any plans of, of uh, making the group bars and home bars configurable? Configurable how? Um, because the uh, basically I want to organize the, the directories and I'm forced of having these group bars and Oh uh, okay, so you're you're wanting yeah. to you're wanting to manage how Ansible reads those directories. Yeah, so those three directories. Okay. Which are forced in the Parent directory. Understood. All right. Um, not 100% sure if that's 
uh, a route that we're going to be taking. Um, but I will follow up on that for you. Um, I know we are making changes to roles in the future. Uh, one of the things I was going to cover for 2-2, um, what that structure is and how we're handling variables may have some introduction to how group bars and host bars are managed and utilized, but I'm not 100% sure about that hierarchical view. What do you want to do with it? Do you just want to move yeah. the files or do you want to store it in a different medium? Um, because if I'm not wrong, that directory is executable the same way as the inventory file, so you can literally have a proxy there if you want to read out the database or something else. Well, uh, my use case is just simple. Just um, manage it in a different directories because there are a lot of a lot of uh, directories also that are configurable but how come these two are right. not configurable and a sim link alone can solve your problem right? well uh, that's what i do now right but it's better if uh, minimize or no sim link at all okay yeah i'll, I'll definitely have to follow up on on that for you because i'm not sure we we haven't we haven't broached that at all in community discussions, um, but it never hurts to ask. It might just be something that comes later for sure. Um, with that, there's a hat for you up here for asking a question. Uh, if you guys ask me questions, I've got cool stuff that uh, I brought along with me from the US. So, there's, uh, there's a lot of stuff. So yeah, a don't lot stop of asking. Stuff. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, see, currently other automation tools like uh, Copper and Chef yep. use a programming language like such. If you take Chef, use Ruby. Yep. And Copper use Python. Yep. So you guys use, for example, Linux use Shell. So is there any op uh, plans in the future? Are you going to use some constant program uh, tools to adopt? Or? Also, we use uh, Python as our language for the actual engine. <coughs> All modules are preferred to be written in Python. I mean, you can actually write them in any language. And then from a, a syntax perspective, the playbook will continue to be YAML based. Um, the whole point that we go with with Ansible is the fact that it's human readable and simple to write playbooks. So you don't have that crazy structure like you do with a puppet manifest, right? Yeah. So I don't see that changing anytime in the future. But to write your own module, I mean, you can put it in any language you want to. Um, and then the code itself is all Python based. So definitely take a look at that for sure. Um, outside of that, you can write plugins that coincide with playbooks. Um, I've seen people write those in Ruby code. I myself have written them in Python. I had a team member that wrote one in Java. I mean, it's really up to you how you want to write anything to attach to Ansible. Yeah. Because each organization has their own standards, right? So. Um, in what way? Means, uh, certain people say that I don't, they don't adopt Ruby, they don't, don't adopt Perl, they use only Python. Some people will yeah. say it, yeah. so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, it's whatever you want to write a module in. We don't care. If you're going to commit it to core, for other people to use, then that's when we care and we ask you to write it in Python or PowerShell for Windows. Outside of that, you can write it in whatever language you choose. I think there's even examples how to write them in Bash. Yeah. Online. There are. Yeah. Is that a requirement for the extras modules? Yes. Yes. Anything that gets committed to us, it's required. So just to clarify, in Windows, you actually build up PowerShell and not on Python? Uh, it's okay. Correct. In Windows, it's PowerShell only, no Python. It used to be Python, right. not anymore. Yep. Uh, speaking, of, so speaking of Windows, mm -hmm. um, a few months ago, I was looking at it um, based on the version 2.001, something. Yeah. Um, my use case was about actually to get inventory mm -hmm. on the uh, software installed on the Windows workstations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because um, basically the, the main intention is to uh, uh, what's this? monitor the licenses yeah. 
which basically uh, I need to know exactly the different versions and different software installed in different yep. workstations. Yep. <laughs> and I found out that uh, from this uh, PowerShell, it's, it's yeah. very basic. So, um, uh, because uh, a while ago you mentioned about support of uh, of one Yes. Yes. Uh, 2.1. So, <coughs> how extend? Uh, what's what's the status basically? Uh, because I haven't seen the latest uh, at Simo. Fair enough. Um, so I'll say in 2.1, definitely still not quite there yet. Um, but we'll we'll talk again and when I get to 2.2. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, why did you guys move to PowerShell and you no know, from Python? Well, because PowerShell is on all of the systems, right? Uh, when it comes to Windows, PowerShell 3 exists on most Windows systems to date, and that is the preferred method of management when it comes to Windows. Installing Python <coughs> is just like asking a Windows admin to install Java, right? It's kind of it's almost pulling teeth out to get a Windows admin to install anything other than what is a Windows thing. But that could be applicable to any system, right? For That's true. So why only specifically Windows? Basically for Linux or like Bash or other scripts? Well, so from the Linux side of the house, it just needs Python. So all systems technically have Python on them now. We're going with the lowest common denominator of of a uh, automation uh, language that can be our transport mechanism, and those are the two lowest common denominators on both of those system architectures. Is Python 2.7? Right now, it's Python 2.4. So it's a great point. So um, to allow Ansible to manage a host, it's 2.4. We're going to be changing that in the future, which I'll talk about in uh, about the in the 2.2 uh, time frame. Yes? Will there be a lot of backward incompatible um, applications? Because like 2.1 2 actually um, we encountered the, the become user. Mm -hmm. It slightly changed and yep. we have to you know, rewrite a lot of playbooks because of that. Yep. Any particular reason why the become user changes? Because of Windows? Because <laughs> that whole, right? So we're all used to sudo, right? Yeah. And sudo doesn't exist in the Windows world because they're, you know, back passwords in Windows. Um, I'm not a Windows fan, by the way, so I will bash it. Um, anyways, uh, we've got the Windows users that are used to become and become user and become method. So in 2.1, um, it isn't a fail hard. There are some, some bugs associated to it, obviously, but either way, eventually it's going to be a hard fail. We're just deprecating pseudo in place of the become uh, declarative, more or less. Yes? Um, sorry, I, I realize you mentioned you're not a big fan uh, of Windows, but. So okay. I work with I work with the financial institution where all our where all our servers are Windows servers. I'm sorry, and, <laughs> and, I will not be working there. <laughs> and one of the things which we're looking for is is a, is a good uh, deployment mechanism. Was as checking yeah. like a few months ago, and, and you know the Windows full support was available. How committed would uh, would you guys be in in terms of Windows support uh, moving forward? You mentioned that that 2.2 would would be you know, more extensive, and yeah. more specifically in terms of MS builds, uh, as old as it is, but <laughs> uh, how, you know, how, how, how much do you think uh, you, you do to support that? So, you know, we're, we're touching a lot of that on 2.2, so I'm going to skip the cool new tool announcement and jump right to 2.2. And to talk about Windows, um, our focus of Windows is to get full parity with Linux. We are 100% committed to Windows. So that Windows engineer, his full-time job right now is to rewrite a whole PowerShell module API so it's easier to just hack on new PowerShell modules. So another thing that we're working with for Windows is we're going to be providing a WinShell and a WinCommand um, module set 
So on the Linux side of the house, we have shell and command to execute commands. So we're going to provide those for Windows. Um, we're also building out um, environment uh, variable support for Windows. Um, asynchronous tasks we're going to provide for Windows management as well. Um, and then pipelines, we're going to handle that within Windows as well. So we're, we're fully invested in it because we're basically the only ones out there that can really deploy and automate Windows to its fullest extent. Yeah, yeah that'd be by the line. Yeah. Like you find the best one. Um, that probably speak you up. Yeah, definitely. Microsoft also launched an automation tool for automating the entire product. The free, that tool they gave free as well. Are you talking about a CCM or a CCM? It's no? a new product, I forgot the name. Hmm. So we are using it actually. Is it working well? Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, they are normally doing a patching. Oh, okay. Windows patching, and uh, because we moved out from BMC to uh, to Micro, I forgot the name. To I just was looking for it. If you remember, I, I'm interested. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear the name of it, and I'll I'll Google it myself too. You had a question. It just came recently. Like within the past past month, or uh, it was uh, Microsoft. Still, they are. Um, we're going to each organization and they are selling the product. So it's free. It's all yeah, yeah. free. Okay. Yeah, I'll look that up for sure. Uh, is there any support for Hyper-V? Um, so we're definitely thinking about that. Not in the 2-2 time frame, but we're thinking uh, even for it, we're going to definitely support Hyper-V for sure. So do you have any advice for those who are using Hyper-V now? Um, you know, I'm, I was Googling it the other day to see if anybody's doing that. And I don't see anything. So either a lot of people aren't managing Hyper-V with Ansible, or they've just kept it internal and haven't committed anything and haven't blogged about it. Because um, honestly, I can't find a thing. And I, I, don't, I don't hear anything in IRC about it either that I recall. I would guess um, the strategy would be putting something in between like a cloud stack or open stack, I mean, a, a cloud management platform that then manages Hyper-V yeah. as a virtualizer. So you're talking to an API that is sort of cloud orchestration, not VM orchestration. Right. On that point, uh, mm -hmm. any plugins about coming for Clicker? For a Clicker? Clicker is also a cloud management Not that I can recall, but uh, I'll definitely look into that. Okay afterwards. Yes? In terms of containers you mentioned, and I see a lot about Docker, right? What about uh, the other container runtime environments, such as the application component? Yeah, so images. Uh, definitely. Um, so to jump back really quick, we announced last week a cool new, new tool, Ansible Container. Who here has heard about Ansible Container? <laughs> One person. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> You need so, to use Red Hat's marketing vehicle as well. Huh? You need to use Red Hat's marketing vehicle. Nah. nah. So, um, so Ansible Container is uh, was opened last week. That is going to be our way to drive the container initiative. So, right now with Ansible Container, you can use a single playbook and automatically create a Docker container. Same approach, uh, OCI initiative, everything else will go through that process as well. Right now, Docker is the big one out there. Everybody's using it, so that's why we tackled that one first. It was also a realization for us to see that that Docker Compose file was literally very close to a playbook. So we're leveraging a module that transforms a playbook into an actual Docker file. Yes. So how does that compare to like things like machine D mm -hmm. within system D itself and things like format? So like is there any sort of difference? Um, definitely a difference because you're writing a playbook. So that same playbook that you wrote to deploy on a cloud instance or on a bare metal system, now you can use that playbook to automatically create a container and then ship it. It is a command that comes with Ansible Container. 
to deploy directly into uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes. And then we're also adding multiple platforms and support for that as well. So we're, we're super excited because there's always been a disconnect of how do you easily build a container. So we're taking the playbook and making it the mechanism to build that container now. So um, as I mentioned, we opened it last week. If you go to github.com slash ansible slash ansible dash container, you can see the code there. Give it a try. We would love the feedback on that um, because we want more users to start using it like Ansible was used. Uh, because the more community members, the only it's just going to keep getting better and better. So definitely give it a try and let us know what you think. And uh, start using Ansible Container. Question. Yes. Uh, how does part of the integration of Ansible to cloud forms right now? Um, it is in process. That's about all I can say right now. Uh, we're still working out internally what those integrations are going to look like, but obviously there's going to be some integrations. Right now, what you can do, just out of the box, mm -hmm. with CloudForms, you can have CloudForms call a uh, callback URL within uh, Tower, effectively, mm -hmm. to drive automation. Outside of that, what we're actually going to do between the two products, uh, we're still thinking about internally how we're going to do that. Yeah, because in cloud, the new version of CloudForms, which is 4.1, mm -hmm. uh, I can see that the configuration management is now supporting Foreman mm -hmm. and Ansible Tower. Yep. Uh, we assume that it supports Foreman open source, mm -hmm. but Red Hat says that it's Red Hat Satellite, not the Foreman open source. Right. So uh, I don't know if the Ansible will also be supporting the open source. Uh, so uh, the route that we're going to take from a product pers perspective will always be Tower mm -hmm. as a product. Mm -hmm. um, because Core doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a simple enough API structure to just plug into other systems while Tower has that. So that's that's the reason why you would you would see Tower in the product and not core in the product. And then the same thing goes for satellite or anything else. It will always be with Tower. It's just kind of like what I do with all of our partners. I work Tower into the story as opposed to core just because it's simpler to develop against. <coughs> Yes. There are some sorry, no, there ahead. are some overlap between the satellite and the Ansible in, in terms of the configuration management. Yeah. So what's the roadmap going ahead? So you want to pause on the satellite and the covering with the Ansible? Or? No, no pause happening there. So satellite will continue down its path. Okay. And then Ansible will continue down a, a similar path. Mm -hmm. What um, basically us as Ansible, we always have customers that run Ansible and the other tools. We never tell them to rip out the other tools and just go with Ansible. You can run them side by side. And we're totally cool with that. So it's that same approach that we're going to do with Red Hat. We want to enable our customers to do what they want to do. We don't want to kind of dictate them, this is the way to do it through Ansible. We're obviously going to keep the Puppet stuff in there. And then Ansible will just come along for the ride as well for the net new customers that want to utilize something easier. Yes. Can you plan to extend support on automatic uh, provisioning of bare metal servers? You know, we toyed that um, idea for a very long time. Um, I remember we first talked about that in 1.4, <coughs> if I recall correctly. Um, Community-wise, we kind of just halted that discussion because Cobbler, I mean, uh, Mike DeHaan created Ansible. He also created Cobbler. And he basically said, I don't want to do this again. Um, so the way that I thought about it, because I have kind of that same idea as he does, um, because Ansible is a tool that can tell other tools to handle provisioning, nothing saying that a, a Cobbler module could come out and tell Cobbler to manage provisioning. Um, there's a vendor 
in San Diego that I'm working with that does some pretty cool stuff with system provisioning that I'm working with right now um, that spans multiple types of hardware products. So we're going to work with them more. Um, but yeah, I don't see right now anytime in the near future Ansible Core by itself doing system provisioning. Yes. Do you have a roadmap for Tower as well? I do have a roadmap for Tower. Um, are you all interested in hearing Tower roadmap at the end? I'll talk about it for like five minutes at the end, I promise. So one thing about meetups, we try to keep it as less product-centric, more community-focused. Um, at least at my San Francisco meetup, I try to. Um, you in the back, and then you over here. Would there be a difference from a quite native to Ubuntu or Ansible both for the version? Yes. Uh, so in 2.2, we are definitely working on um, Ansible Vault. I'm trying to find my slide on that. The meeting has ended because it had only one participant for the last 30 minutes. Oh, well. I'll do that. Um, so from a, a platform enhancement standpoint, when it comes to Vault, we're going to be able to provide the ability to work with multiple Vault password files at one time, um, and multiple Vault files per playbook run. So we're making those improvements. Um, we're providing availability to all of that via filters as well. And then, um, and then per variable vaulting is going to come as well as a part of the platform enhancements. Uh, for encryption wise, I think we're talking about increasing encryption. To what? I'm not 100% sure. Um, but the cool thing, all of these things that I'm speaking to when it comes to roadmap, by the way, is open and available on our repo. So just go to the repo. There's a document called Roadmap. If you open it, it's everything that we're talking about here today in a lot more detail in some cases, too. So uh, definitely go take a look at it. Uh, we spent about two weeks on building that for the community. So uh, look at it. Um, when it comes to uh, the rest of the platform enhancements, a huge bit of work that we're working on in 2.2 is the Python 3 migration. We're going to actually make a switch to <laughs> Python 3 being the um, engine runner of choice, mostly because Red Hat 8 is moving to Python 3. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of systems are just shipping with Python 3 by default. So as such, 2.4 is kind of going to phase out. And it's going to move to a 2.6 or 2.7 minimum. So the work has already begun with that platform migration. We're just going to go in full force with it for the 2.2 time frame and probably roll it out in 2.3, maybe 2.4. So it's going to be a gradual change, but that's kind of what we're working on. So would that mean the endpoints will also be a Python upgrade? Um, the managed nodes will need to upgrade? Yes. That is kind of going to be the expectation. That's why it's not going to be a, you know overnight change. We're going to do a gradual change. It's kind of like how we've been handling playbook deprecations. It'll be the same thing. We'll start warning ahead of time saying, hey, you know, we're going to be requiring 2.6 or 2.7 now. Think about what it's going to take to upgrade those. And I mean, it's not happening anytime soon, so don't stress, but it's eventually going to come. Um, along with that, we're going to make con connection handling improvements. Uh, I mentioned the, the changes to roles. We're working on a lot of uh, things when it comes to roles. And then um, inventory handling is changing. So I'm going to assume stuff is probably going to change with, with uh, variable structures because those are directly tied to inventory and how inventory is handled. So um, I'll ask in community what we're thinking about and probably get that filtered up to the roadmap so people can view that. You still have a question, I think? Yeah, I guess um, it's probably a, a good segue after the future stuff, but where do you see the container management stuff going with you know, other tools? I know there's a bit of Kubernetes work that's going into there, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, where the things fit in with 
open shift and now that Chef's starting to get into the space with a new tool and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, Chef did, Puppet made their announcement about two months ago. I think for us, we're, we're definitely um, there as well. And Ansible Container is the beginning of that. So along with Ansible Container came modules for Kubernetes um, and modules for OpenShift. We're just going to keep improving on those. Um, we partner very well with Google. Um, I have a weekly meeting with Google actually about uh, not only Kubernetes, but we talk uh, GCE as well. So we're making improvements there. Um, and then just because of Kubernetes, I mean, OpenShift, right, is, is Kubernetes. So we're very close to the OpenShift team. I mean, OpenShift is installed with Ansible. So they're huge fans of Ansible, and we're huge fans of them. I mean, I'm a Kubernetes fanboy by just default. So I'm pushing on that train as hard as I can because I think there's a lot of room for growth there. That being said, we're talking about a meso story. We want to start crafting that. Um, and then I'm a huge HashiCorp fan. So I'm talking to HashiCorp, and we're talking about you know a Terraform console HashiCorp vault story kind of thing. So definitely the container space is interesting to us, and we want to be involved with it. And just because everybody that uses Ansible is involved in containers in some sort. So, I mean, it just kind of, kind of comes along with it. That's the beauty of Ansible. It's always been com community driven rather than a company that oversees it. We just only made that company three years ago now, right? So. <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of overlap though in terms of. Of course. You know, is there, do you think there's going to be a sweet spot that finds its way in there as the you know, layer for management? Or you know, the, the, the overlap can be seen everywhere, right? There's overlap with satellite, there's overlap with cloud forms, there's overlap with OpenShift. Um, <clears throat> the way that we think about it is because Ansible can manage all of those services as well as manage the tools that manage those services, you, you pick the tool or the instrument that does the job best for you as the user. We don't want to dictate that it's only the Ansible way. The Ansible way to us is enabling you, the users, an easier way to manage those tools that you, you choose to purchase or utilize. So when it comes to manage IQ slash cloud forms, you utilize Ansible to manage manage IQ slash cloud forms, as opposed to logging into it, spinning up the instances, and then have it go to Ansible. You can definitely have that workflow happen, but why not just have a playbook that manages the whole workflow itself, and then just log into Tower at the press of a button, and it does everything automatically. You know, that's the story that we're trying to craft. Is Ansible is that tool that manages everything. We've got a really cool graphic on Red Hat's website about Tower being that tool that manages all the tools in a tool chain, and that's really how we've always thought Ansible to be and why Tower is that framework to, to do that. Um, let's see. So networking, we're definitely building on networking more. Um, so I mentioned Open vSwitch. We're gonna do routing support, GoBGP and Quagga. Um, and then VMware is getting love. They're actually going to become a first-class citizen in um, Ansible support on the hardware side as well as the network side. So um, more to be seen there. And then other network vendors that we're not allowed to talk about at all. Um, and let's see, so Tower. Tower 3.0, we're doing... Um, just a U user experience refresh, so that's coming. Um, question? So other than being able to manage open flow, is there any other SDN providers that you guys would be working with? Yeah. Are, are you that's allowed to disclose? No. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we are. 
Yes, sir. So you mentioned about the support on uh, networking modules. Yes. So you're saying that uh, in 2.1, uh, these uh, networking modules. Yeah, Cisco, ready. Juno S, all of those. Yep. So including the US? Yes. Yeah, that's all in 2.1. In 2.2, we're switching over to SDNs. Um, because so the soft on the hardware side of the house, most of them are covered in 2.1. We're obviously going to keep building off of that in 2.2, but we're going to be focusing on SDNs in 2.2 as well. Do you think that uh, those uh, V-switch, open V-switch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That will be on the 2.2? 2.2, correct. Internet is using the SSH, the LED, or is it directly the HTTP? Uh, yeah, it's the over to their APIs. That's how we are communicating. But the legacy device, devices is all SSH, LED, or not? Um, so the legacy devices, most of them uh, are over, uh, I, I forget if they're even manageable. Most of them are uh, Nexus OS. Yeah. yeah. And the newer, the newer stuff that most people are on <laughs> nowadays. So um, I think the legacy devices are out, as far as I remember. Okay. I might not be 100%. I'm not a network guy, and I will never claim to be one personally. Support yes. for NewWatch? I'm sorry, who? Uh, NewWatch, Mr. SDN Um. Name doesn't ring a bell, but even if it was, I can talk about it. And you, you mean New York bought by Alcatel? Yeah. 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 Uh, I can talk about their support in Tarpon. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the latest release of Tarpon 4.1, I think, has been released, and that's going to support um, uh, SDN New York's plugin natively in Tarpon. So they've been a good partner of ours in Cloudforms for, for a while, but uh, now they're going to be native in the actual UI, which is great news for us in general because you can you can because then you can handle you can call that from Ansible, right? Yep. And that would be back to your calling both ways. Yep. One very high level question probably. Because this is completely a configuration management and OS system level. Is there any plan kind of a process level orchestration where it interact with the kind of a application level and people build the like a integration with the service now or integration with the like a with that? Welcome to Ansible, my friend, because <laughs> it is not only just config management. You can actually do all of that. So um, Ansible it has four use cases. It, configuration management is just one of the four. Um, we do application deployments. So yes. me personally, I did all my app deployments. Um, after that application deployment occurred, I also added it to monitoring, um, okay. and then also added it to PagerDuty and Pingdom okay. as well. I actually wrote those two modules myself, um, and then um, added it into load balancers. Um, so at the software layer of the load balancer, I added in the service. That's that's the power of Ansible by itself, is it's just not system level config management. It does a lot of other stuff. ServiceNow specifically, we have an integration with ServiceNow and Tower. So you can kick off uh, jobs to Tower via ServiceNow. And then ServiceNow could also be utilized as a dynamic inventory, uh, potentially, to pull systems out and do automation against them. It can be done, my friend. <laughs> Welcome to Ansible. You're in. You're in good group here. So how how easy or difficult it is to integrate service now with Ansible? Like, is it something I can do bringing by papers or stuff or integration services? Um, definitely get in, in contact with your Red Hat rep, and then they can get you through the process of what what that looks like for sure. <coughs> yes. Um, just a request for uh, documentation. Sure. The support of. Uh, Redis because it's there, um, but then I haven't seen that documentation. Uh, support, extent. you mean Ansible <coughs> utilizing Redis? Yes. yes. Okay. As a key value store? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, noted. I will, I will, uh, I, I don't know how much more to, to answer to that, honestly, because um, I, I agree with you, the support is there. Um, it's just a matter of getting down and writing the docs. That's the thing about um, one pitch I could make about the community. One thing that we always say is even if you just commit to docs, you're, a, you're involved in the community and you're a contributor. Um, and there is a lot of room for growth for docs. Um, so the Redis Key Value Store and how Ansible can utilize that. Um, only recently have we focused on the developer guidelines for Ansible. That's been lacking for the past four years. And that's because one person in the community stood up and said, you know what, we need these. Let's stop pussyfooting around about this and get that in. So we actually finally did it. So it's just a matter of where do people want to focus? And honestly, a lot of people just want to write code for Ansible and write modules because that's the cool thing. But there is a lot of room for docs as well. So if you guys want to write docs for us, we would love just the commits on docs as well. So definitely. On that topic as well, I know that one of the criticisms that a lot of people have is the lack of tests on the core modules. Is that on the roadmap? That is on the roadmap. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, part of that came with the architecture change. Yes. Now that 2.0 has changed, we have the way to facilitate a lot of those testings. And we're doing a heavy focus on what is a core module versus what's an extras module and, and how we facilitate those changes and testing paradigms. So a lot is coming in the future with that, for sure. It won't be perfect. Because testing is never perfect, obviously, but it it definitely is coming. Um, so back to Tower Three, we're changing permissions a, a bit and how we handle permissions because it's kind of a pain right now. Um, integrated notifications are coming in Tower Dot Three, and um, runtime job configuration is coming on. And finally, um, integrations with Red Hat products are coming in Tower 3 as uh, dynamic inventory endpoints. What's the likelihood that it's going to be open source? Uh, there are discussions, but no, no time frame. I mean, obviously, so Red Hat opens everything, right? Tower is no different. When to be determined. That's all I got, guys. I mean, honestly, um, I went through our six-month roadmap with you for right now. So um, the one thing uh, I know, to, it sucks for this side of the globe, but we have uh, multiple meetings a week. However, it happens at like 2 AM your time. Um, the one thing I can say about those meetings is every single one of those meetings that happen over chat are recorded. Um, so you can look. Uh, via another repo, it's called Community Repo. Each one of those meetings are linked to, and you can see what we discuss. You'll see me a lot in there. I'm Thamos on IRC. I'm actually Thamos everywhere. So uh, GitHub, Twitter, uh, IRC. Um, we're, we're very vocal. We're a very passionate community. And just because all of you are a part of the Ansible community, that only makes it better. So um, being involved on the other side of the globe is just as easy as signing in and taking a look at what we discussed and contributing to pull requests and issues that we may have open. And we're very accepting of all of them. So I uh, would love to get more involvement because I would love to see an Ansible Fest here in APAC. It gives me another reason to come back to the region and actually bring my wife with me this time. <laughs> Feature request. All right. Hit it. The standard output when uh, uh, running Ansible uh -huh. should be sent to XFPP, the chat, the chat room. So that is definitely so. Um, XMPP, I'm wondering, do we have a module for that? I don't. Yes. Yeah. But that's going to configure. Uh, 
what I'm trying to say is the output you'll mm -hmm. see from standard the out. Send it out the chat. So that I'm definitely doing with Tower because all of that is handled in multiple API endpoints. It's not as easy to manage with, with Ansible by itself unless somebody writes a, uh, a callback plugin that can do that. So I'll, I'll definitely add that as a feature request for core, um, but I can tell you I'm definitely doing that with Tower. Can Ansible can be exposed to as an API or like in JSON or XML format? Mm -hmm. Well, it already is. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not talking, I'm just talking about JSON. Yeah, so it already is exposed as JSON. So it's just a matter of writing a plugin that can transport that JSON to um, to another chat service, more or less. Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? Gripes? Cool. So did you guys find this first um, meetup a good level setter? Um, I, I would say for the future, how, how often are you planning on doing I guess it depends on on uh, I mean what we can fit them with, yeah. uh, and also I mean the, in terms of venue. So hopefully uh, Red Eyes is going to be uh, nice to us and, and let us sort of reconvene. Sure. So what's uh, and, and also I mean it's it's up to you guys. I mean what you want want to fill it with. Uh, I mean, we have we have opportunity to bring us as as I mentioned. I mean we can. If we don't have anybody physically speaking, we can bring in somebody who can do it on uh, remotely, uh, either from the states or from from Europe. Yeah. Uh, but even but even better, I mean, if you have a story to, to to share, I mean, feel free. Yeah. You have some volunteers who release a story or do a talk for half an hour. Or something we could make up four of those for one in a couple months or something. I mean, the the one thing that works at my meetups is is you guys run this every day. I mean, just tell your story about what you do and how you utilize Ansible. That's um, you know, I'm a firm believer of something I do maybe something you haven't thought of and vice versa is something you do I never would have thought of um, and I've been using this for four years now so you know it there's always a two heads are better than one and the fact that there's 40 to 50 plus of us in here I mean it, it just screams that there's an idea out there that somebody hasn't thought of share your story it, it always makes a great meetup Cool. Why, why did you choose Ansible when you started, when you started and not Chef, Puppet, or Salt? Um, I chose Ansible because it, it goes to those four use cases. Um, back when I used them, Puppet and Chef definitely didn't do application deployment. Um, and I needed a tool that handled app deployment. Um, and Ansible fit the bill with me. Um, I was also a huge fan of Cobbler, so it kind of came along with it. Um, so that's that's ultimately why we chose Ansible. And it was also a lot easier to manage. I didn't have to install a Puppet server. I didn't have to install a Chef server. I just I pip installed Ansible on my laptop. Did you know about Hudson or Jenkins then? Oh yeah, I did. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan. But it doesn't, th those tools are great. But they're good build tools. You know, they they're good at managing builds. Having them manage deployments. Mm. Yeah. Back yeah. then, Jenkins didn't even do deployment. I mean, yeah. that's sort of predating that. I mean, I mean, all these are decent at it now. But I mean, because I had the same thing three years ago. I was looking at Chef. I was looking at Puppet, and I was. It was frustrating that I had to spend a week to deploy the first machine, literally. Yeah. Whereas with Ansible, I mean, I wrote a playbook, it installed it, sort of added an RPM repo, installed my app, it configured my, because I had the same problem, I mean, app deployment primarily, and not sort of just instantiating a machine. And it took me 90 minutes yeah. from reading the documentation. For me, Ansible was good because Python was already there. Yeah. Uh, and there was no chef server or puppet server to install. Uh, my first stumbling block came when I started playing with core OS. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it didn't have Python. Yeah. So you have to install this mini Python. Well, you can bootstrap Python with Ansible. Yeah. Yep. Well, Although it's a bit of a pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It does. But it's it possible. Awesome. I actually have, so I'm um, on my plane flight up from Australia to here. 
I wrote, I started writing a playbook to bootstrap a Fedora workstation because I'm actually migrating off of that monstrosity right there, um, moving completely over to Fedora. My playbook is going to bootstrap workstation, get Python 2 installed on it, then install all of my baseline packages for me locally, and then I'm going to be committing a role up to Galaxy that is developer-centric around Ansible and uh, the Docker paradigm. So um, keep an eye out for that, definitely. But um, yeah, that's what I'm working on. Yeah, um, in regards to CoreOS, there is also from Nathan Leclerc, I think from Docker, he has this blog article where he creates an Ansible container, then he, he gives it like a privileged role, and in that container basically he runs the whole playbook thing yep. uh, on CoreOS uh, to, to deploy it. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's uh, so you, yeah. Because CoreOS is all containers, right? Yes, yeah, correct. So, so you have to fiddle with CoreOS itself. Yeah. 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 So, and he brings up a good point. Docker, Docker.com, all Ansible, mind you. <laughs> They're huge fans of Ansible, even though they won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Ansible is now a Red Hat company. 